Hiya. Oh, thanks a lot for coming along. Um, tonight's show, tonight's show is about, um, is about the Tube, is about railways, is about Labour Party and fuck-ups in general. And um, I know people who, who will be watching the show who are not from London are going, why are you talking about the Tube, which is in London? Well, three reasons. Firstly, it carries as many passengers as the rail network does in a year. Secondly, people who visit London use it. Thirdly, Tube privatisation is the biggest flagship going. This is a flagship policy. And if they sink this one, we're on a roll. <laughs> we're on a roll. Because up and down the country, there are hospitals being put out to private tender, there are schools getting private finance, there are roads, there's railways. People have had enough of it, they're sick of it, they don't want it. And if they win in London on the tube, everyone is invited down to Trafalgar Square for the riot. Party, party. <laughs> I don't want the tube to be privatised. Prescott, Prescott is the architect of tube privatisation. John Prescott. Like he fucking uses it. <laughs> so I travelled during the rush hour on the tube. I would know if John Prescott was there because we'd feel his presence. <laughs> John's on everyone, squeeze in. <laughs> He doesn't even know what the fucking tube is. He probably sees people disappearing into holes in the ground and thinks it's a nostalgic reunion for the mining industry we used to have. <laughs> He's driving past. The thing about it is, when you privatise a rail network like the railways or the tube, you fragment it. You get all these different companies to do this, and everyone has to talk about whose responsibility is, who's doing that. I'm renting from you, you know, you're renting from me. This is going on. And this is the thing. We met a guy. Right, this, is, this is kind of like a really just small example, but I think perfectly illustrates it. We met a guy for, called Danny McNichol who gave us a ring. And he, he used to work for British Rail up in Derby, and he used to work on the track. And he had an accident at work, and there was a, a van drove into a ditch, and he had a back injury. Balfour Beatty took over the running of the contract. When he got better and was able to do light duties, Balfour Beatty said they couldn't find him a job. So he couldn't go back to work. But they wouldn't sack him. So he can't work, but he can't be sacked. And every week, Balfour Beatty sent him a paycheck with the grand sum of naught. <laughs> every week, he got one of these. In fact, I'm, I'm fibbing slightly. Danny, by the way, has got boxes of these things. Uh, one of them here is for naught. Uh, the next week, I don't know why, he gets seven pence. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's down to naught again. And I said to Danny, what did you get the seventh pence for? He said, I think it was performance related. <laughs> Balfour Beatty, by the way, say, well, the, the reason we gave him all those pay slips was an anomaly that we inherited from the pre-privatisation era that merely took us five years to work out. Mm. Right? Now, Danny, he took them to a tribunal because he's, he's a feisty bastard. He actually formed a band called the Balfour Beatty Won't Let Me Go Back to Work Band. <laughs> And he used to tour it around pubs in Derby, and I thought it was magnificent. Yeah, that's wonderful. Don't you wish that other bands would do that? The S Club 7 were called Polydor Record Exploit Talentless Teenagers for Profit. Wouldn't that be... <laughs> so anyway, Danny, right, he wins his tribunal. He takes him this long to prove that Balfour Beatty are his employer. The day that he won his tribunal, well, shortly after he won his tribunal, we went up with him, because the tribunal said that Balfour Beatty employ him and must find him work within whatever branch of Balfour Beatty it is. They have to get him a job. This is uh, Danny McNichol who's presenting himself Hello. for work today. Yeah. <laughs> and he's come here to, yeah. to see if he can get his work. I notified them I was returning to work today. Well, so. You've lost me here, I'm sorry. Danny. Um, Yes. Do you want to explain? <laughs> so we crossed the corridor into another bit of Balfour Beatty. He said, Balfour Beatty, they said Balfour Beatty projects. Danny McNichol reporting for duties. You're not right. supposed to be meeting Tracy Harrison, are you? No, am I? Personnel manager. Personnel. She might be Don't handy, me. though. Then we went into another bit that's Balfour Beatty track maintenance. And we said, oh, Balfour Beatty, ready for Danny to start work again. The tribunal said that Danny should be, that it should be sorted out as soon as possible. Right. And Balfour Beatty were responsible. Okay. And so Danny's sort of merely reporting for work, because that's the, the ruling from the tribunal. And they said, no, don't know anything, sit there. Another bloke says, you've got to go. Then someone says, you've got a phone call for you. I'm like, what? So we're in this weird Franz Kafka nightmare with hard hats, right? <laughs> Tracy, 
It's Mark Thomas from Channel 4. So you want us to leave the premises, right? She said, you've got to leave the premises now or we'll call the police because you're trespassing. I said, does that include Danny? She said, yes, we'll do him for trespass. He's your, he's your employee. Can I stay? Um, can this Danny chap stay or has he got to go as well? No. You've all got to go, please. All of us. All of us got to go. Danny's got to go as well. OK. Now, many of us would find this an enviable situation to be in. <laughs> I'm here for work. You can't come in. Hooray! <laughs> So, we go to Balfour Beatty Regional Head Office and to prove that Danny is capable of light duties, we have a flatbed truck with an office fully equipped on the back of it. Danny gets on and starts to prove he can do light duties, like answer the phone. Hello, uh, my name's Mark Thomas from Channel 4. Uh, we're filming it here. Um, a Balfour Beatty around. Oh, well, I can't let you in, I've been told you what you mean. They won't come down at all? Why are they so cowardly? They won't come down, Danny. No one will come down at all. Oh. They won't talk to us. They're, they're hiding in the office somewhere. Good afternoon, Balsamiti Rail. Well, there's uh, Trace Harrison there, too, please. I'm afraid not. No, she's out of the office at the moment. All oh, right, can I speak Do to I somebody? Help? Yes, uh, Danny McNichol. I'm recording here for Channel 4 and I'd like to speak to somebody. Uh, I'm due to return to work today. I'm afraid I can't speak to you while recording. You'll need to speak to the press office at Marjorie Hooper. You've oh, already right. got the number. Can I speak? Thank you. And who are you? I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to give you my name. Oh, Thank that's, that's fair enough. Bye. Yeah, bye. So anyway, they call the cops, the cops come along, and uh, they're, they're quite sweet, actually, because they all bought us a cup of tea. <laughs> we got chatting to the cop, and he said, look, what do you want? I said, well, I want Danny to get a job. We're not living in fairy tale world, are we? Um, what's going to happen? We, we, I mean, well, there, you know, there's, there's debates there. They're not going to come down and say, right, come on, Dan, come on in. This is obviously... You and Danny are here for a reason, and you know I, I appreciate why you're here. Right. Um, the report we had was that you'd entered by force. Uh, oh, that's ridiculous. I, I know it is. I've spoke to uh, I spoke to the officers, and uh, I'm happy that there was no forced entry. He said, but you've got to move on. I've got things to do. They've got things to do. You've got things to do. You have to move on. And listen, you know, I hope Danny gets his job back. He's a really nice copper. Uh, We'd quite like them to come and talk to uh, us I about mean, it, but I mean, the end of the they're not going to. You know, they're not going to. They're, they're not going to do that. They don't want to to come out and talk about it because they're rightfully embarrassed by the situation. In fact, I phoned him on Friday just to say, "Look, we're including a bit of you in the film," um, and just a really courtesy call to let you know. He said, "Oh, thanks a lot. How's Danny? Has he got his job back?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, don't make me like you." <laughs> No, don't. That's just not fair. <laughs> and he said, why did you choose Danny? He said, because there must be thousands of people up and down the country like this. And I said, that's precisely why we chose Danny. And this is the result of rail fragmentation. This is the result of it. This is what happens to it. This doesn't include anything to do with sort of like passenger safety, accountability, effectiveness, you know, reliability. And you go down to the tube, you know, because fragmentation has worked so well on the railway. You go down to the tube, and Gus MacDonald, Lord Gus MacDonald, um, is now Minister for Transport. Now, this is Gus MacDonald, who was Clydeside shop steward, red activist, who one day must have left work and said, uh, I don't know, they're shutting down the shipyards. There's nothing for it but for me to go down to London to see if I can find work in the House of Lords. <laughs> and join the vermin in ermin. So he gets down there. And he turns around and said, when the, when the railways was fragmented under the Tories, this was a disaster. A little bit of fragmentation un, un, under the Labour Party, with the tube, will be fine. The thing they're doing is, is privatisation, but they call it the Public-Private Partnership, or PPP. And they say, no, 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 no. No, it's not privatisation. It's a Public-Private Partnership. Yeah, it's different. It's a partnership, you see. It's, it's not a partnership, it's a forced marriage. A couple of years from now, John Prescott will be on the telly talking to Martin Bashir going, there were three of us in this marriage. <laughs> and this is the amazing thing. The Labour Party say, no, it's not. It's the Labour government, no, it's not privatisation. It's a public-private partnership. And they have this amazing trick, the Labour Party, of managing to look different and yet the same at the same moment in time, very much like the third Oasis album. And, 
And you think this is incredible because they say, no, 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 it's not privatization. It really isn't. We're just, we're, now we're giving you son of PPP. We had talks. And now we're putting those PPP plans on the shelf and we will find a new enhanced PPP. Son of PPP. George W. PPP. <laughs> it's not if the tube is broken up. There's a bit of when going on here. They've already split the tube up into four distinct companies, three of London Underground and three other distinct companies that are running it as if it was privatised already. And this is in preparation, it's called shadow running, it's in preparation for privatisation, and these companies that they've split it up into are called Infracos. Some bright person at the DETR went along to an advertiser and said, look, we need these companies, they're called uh, infrastructure companies, we need a snappy name for them, what can you do? Infraco, you're a genius. <laughs> What should we call a cup of tea? Kata. I'm working with a maverick. I really am. Rack out another line. Let's pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> and these infracos, well, they're, they're the bits that are going to be sold off to the various consortiums. They're already in place. Under the old stupid, stupid state monopoly, if something went wrong with the tube, somebody would phone up and go, something's wrong with the tube. And they say, what? And they say, that. And they go, right, I'll get X to fix it. Right, sorted. Under PPP, under the proposals that were on the table last week, if something goes wrong, they'll work out whose responsibility it is and how much it will cost them. And they won't just do that silly thing of phoning up. This is the chart to show you whose responsibility it is. <laughs> Can I have my stick? <laughs> You have to go through all the asset failed, not available, is service disruption, report to line control, full attribution process. That's where they all sit around going, well, whose fault is it? I don't know, it's yours. It, no, it's yours, it's not in mine. Look through the contract. Oh, fuck it, spin a bottle, truth or dare. Come on, who's is it? <laughs> That's the route you have to go through. They've also got this thing, how to work out train and carriage ambience. <laughs> Station and train ambience. Audit of train, quality of ride measures. Train lighting, on train noise, PA audibility, ride quality. Heating and ventilation. So they know how to create carriage ambience, which I think, you know, in principle, is a wonderful thing, an ambient carriage. <laughs> That's very good. A bloke with a couple of decks. Do you want a cup of chai, man? Come on, get in there, geezer. Come on. Yeah, a little mirror ball, someone standing at the end going, oh, it's too commercial now, now, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, we thought, I like this idea of ambient carriages. I want to create an ambient carriage. <laughs> So I phoned up some people at very, very short notice, and, and beautiful people that they were, they agreed to do it. So we got a small band together with uh, Dave from Blur, Matty from Dodgy, Steve from Asian Dub Foundation, and Billy Bragg from Essex. <laughs> train, train. But you know that already they've split the tube up into four companies to run it ready for privatisation. It's going to be a nightmare if it's private. Yeah, basically. On train noise, that's really us. Alright. Maybe an eight. An eight? You've got eight out of ten. Not for them. I'm giving them nine out of ten. Oh, nine. Nine. Nine, <laughs> nine out of ten. On train noise. That's us, really. Quite interesting. Excellent. You've, you've been called Skiffle. Pardon? Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Health and Safety Executive uh, letter to London Underground. It's dated the 12th of January 2001. This was when essentially they rejected um, London Underground's um, rail safety case. And some of the things they say here are quite interesting. This is a good one. Competencies are not defined. There are no indication as to who does what on a daily basis. 
No performance standards, no indicators of frequency of maintenance procedures, no definition of terms such as correct and routine. <laughs> Have you fixed that fault? Yeah. Is it correct? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> then they've got, they've got the lovely one here. Other hazards and risks within London Underground Limited do not appear to have been considered in as much depth, such as driving, <laughs> signal operation, track maintenance, assault, vandalism, trespass, slips, trips and falls, which is just about everything with the exception of ticket sales. <laughs> so, and my favourite bit of all, they say here, you have chosen to write your railway safety case in aspirational terms. Not in, we've done this, we're ready for this, but we would hope that we can. You're aspiring. Tonight, Matthew, I want to be a safe railway. <laughs> now, London Underground have said, well, look, you know, we welcome this report, and we constantly seek to improve the quality and service and safety of the railways. But obviously, I don't know whether that statement is aspirational, or whether they actually mean it. Because we spoke to some of the drivers uh, and some of the train staff. And these guys are going on strike, as you know. And they're going on strike for safety. That's why they're doing it. Not to be arsy, for safety reasons. And at the moment, I want you just to remember one thing. This is our underground system. They're your drivers. They're ours. These guys are our guys. So we're chatting to them and we ask them about their very real fears that they have about to privatisation about shadow running. And they said, look, we're worried enough about shadow running. We've got very real fears about that and how that might go, you know, because commercial pressure might start to be exerted on safety. So at the moment, we can take tubes out. If something goes wrong with the tube, we can take it out. Take it out of service, get it fixed. What we're worried about is if the privatisation goes through, people are going to have this, if you take it out, we lose bonus points. Why don't you keep it in? And the commercial pressure, I think, can be seen because they've worked out the cost of every delay in their proposals. London Underground and the Infocos have costed everything. The Waterloo speed restrictions cost them 375 grand, 587 pounds and 82 pence. They've worked it out to the last 82 pence. <laughs> so it is the Oscar Wilde co quote, you know, the price of everything, the value of nothing. And incidentally, I do love Oscar Wilde just because he fucked the Marquis of Queensbury's son, which is fantastic. <laughs> the bloke who wrote the rules for boxing, I've had your son. <laughs> Fucking great. Anyway, when you look at the companies who are bidding to run the tubes, good news is Richard Branson isn't involved. <laughs> Bad news is Balfour Beatty is one of the preferred bidders. <laughs> <laughs> Behind you! So, and we asked Balfour Beatty about their, their maintenance and safety record and they said our standards and procedures compare very favourably with other companies and the rest of the industry. And we said yes, we agree. Because in the last 18 months, out of the companies that are bidding to run the tube, there have been 23 successful prosecutions brought against them by the health and safety executive. Balfour Beatty have five of those. I agree. You do compare very favourably with the rest of the industry. <laughs> and Balfour Beatty, actually, can we show this? Balfour Beatty got this letter, right, for, from Railtrack. And it's a telling off letter. And this is what they say. <laughs> Crap efficiency. Workmanship was appalling. Discuss that this quality of work and poor attitude. Dopey awareness and poor workmanship. Please don't bother writing with apologies and all the usual folder roll. <laughs> When rail track tell you off like that, <laughs> yeah, mate, that's the equivalent of just standing outside Balfour Beatty's office going, you're shit and you know you are. <laughs> and, you see, and Balfour Beatty said, yes, but at the same time they sent us that letter, we got a lovely letter from rail track on the same sort of area, working on the maintenance, and they said that our workmanship was marvellous, it was professional, they were really impressed by the conscientiousness of the workers there. And we said, that's precisely the point with fragmentation. You can be shit and brilliant at the same time. You can actually do that, and that is the keynote. It's the same, but different. It's shit, but wonderful. And this is the whole way it works, right? Because the companies that take over the tube will be judged on their performance. The authorities will judge their performance to be a success 
if they manage to bring their performance levels in at 5% lower than the current ones. So if they fuck up, they've succeeded. We're shit, but we're brilliant. Hooray! <laughs> So we go back to Balfour Beatty and we try to get Danny his job back again. We, it was great. We, Balfour Beatty's head office in London. They got two. They got one at the Angel, just telling you if you're taking notes, if you're preparing for something later on. And they got one in. Um, they've got one near Victoria. And what we did was we got Danny in a security guard's outfit and stuck him outside Balfour by the doors on the pavement with a desk in front of him with an angle poise, pot plant, little bin, executive toy, some notepaper. Danny had a bit of trouble with Balfour Beatty. Oh, right. And um, he's recently won his tribunal to say that Balfour Beatty actually are his employer and should provide him with work. Yeah. And so Danny's here reporting for duties after winning his tribunal. <laughs> Balfour Beatty is still saying they're trying to find him a job. That's what they're trying to find him a job that's suitable. But who knows? So it comes back to the tube and this whole fragmentation issue. What's going to happen to it? Is Prescott going to try and sort of like fudge it? Is Ken going to sort of like stab us in the back? Because they were elected. Ken was elected on a clear mandate. He was elected on save the tube, keep it in public ownership, and fuck Tony Blair. That was his mandate. <laughs> Everyone just went, hey, let's fuck Tony Blair and save the tube. Hooray, tick. <laughs> That's what it was. You've got Bob Kiley, who's this American that's been brought over by Ken to be his commissioner for the Tube. And he's this maverick who's going to go in there and sort it all out. The man who was called in and sorted out the New York Tube and just happened to work for the CIA in his spare time earlier on. You think, well, that'll be handy. He'll be used to dealing with ruthless right-wing bastards like Prescott, so he should be fine. So, you know, I said that the whole thing was about, we're shit, but we're brilliant. This is the final nail in that argument. The consortia that are bidding for the Infracos, they're now saying, one of them is now saying, if the government changed the PPP plans, the privatisation plans, too much, they will take the government to court and sue them for compensation for 30 million. If all Infraco companies do that, so that's nearly 100 million quid we will get sued for just for keeping the tube in public ownership, the thing that we want. Which is a bit like saying to someone, give us 10 quid or I'll mug you. <laughs> so the final thing that um, we want to leave you with is um, we did our own scientific test. And we want people to do it for the, to, to, to measure the quality of ride. Okay? This, this is, it's not that scientific, actually. <laughs> And what we want people to do is, if the tube is privatised, just do, develop your own tests.